to examining cyber's role in the development of business continuity plans that strengthen operational resilience health system cio production sponsored by netscout just a little housekeeping before we get started my name is anthony guerra i'm the founder and editor-in-chief of health system cio and i'll be your moderator today we're looking forward to your participation you can send in your questions or comments at any time in the q a box and we will take them later in the program just so you see how we're going to spend our time today first we're going to go about 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Julian Mahai, CISO at Penn Medicine and the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Adam Zoller, CISO for Providence. Paul Carrillo, CISO at Anova Health System. And Jerry Mancini, Senior Director, Office of the CTO at NetScout. And then we will have our Q&A. So let's jump right in. Uh, Julian, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Anthony. So Julian Mihai serving as a CISO at uh, Penn Medicine, we're an academic medical uh, healthcare uh, center under the umbrella of University of Pennsylvania. Um, six uh, large hospitals, uh, primarily in the greater Philadelphia area and uh, southern New Jersey, 100 plus ambulatory sites, and of course, uh, um, our School of Medicine with uh, all the academia and uh, research. Excellent. Thank you, Adam. Hey, Adam Zoller. I'm the CISO of Providence. We're a healthcare system out on the West Coast. Uh, 53 hospitals, 1,100 clinics, a uh, center out in Hyderabad, India, a for-profit business that operates globally, as well as a high school, a university, a federal credit union, and a health plan. I don't think I missed anything there. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but thanks. All right. Thank you, Adam. Paul? Hello, oh, I'm Paul Carrillo, Vice President, Chief Information Security Officer for Innova Health System. We're a leading nonprofit healthcare provider in Northern Virginia with over 4 million patient visits a year. Uh, we just opened uh, a new hospital in um, uh, uh, Oakville and uh, look to serving our, our community for, for many years to come. So enjoy uh being invited to be here today and have a pleasant conversation with my peers and and with you as well anthony so thank you very much all right very good paul thank you and sorry for forgetting your vp i didn't mean to take that away from you um <laughs> jerry um jerry mancini um so i'm at netscout i'm in the office of the cto and i focus on our cybersecurity solutions um, my background is working with network-based um, systems, you know, building products over many years um, that address networking and network cybersecurity. All right, Jerry, very good. Okay, let's get to our, our first question here. I'm just going to read all this off and you jump in where you want. Uh, Julian, we're going to start with you. What is the CISO's role in preparing the organization to maintain clinical operations if key applications have to be taken offline due to a cyber attack? Where do the CISO's responsibilities end and those of op operational leaders begin? Is it important that clear lines of responsibility are laid out so other leaders do not assume cybersecurity is responsible for more around preparation than it is? And is one of the biggest threats to under preparation the assumption that I thought someone else was handling that, those sort of gaps that can come up if we don't have good communication. So Julian, wherever you wanna jump in there. Yeah, thanks Anthony. And this is a great topic. Uh, uh, you know, I think the uh, uh, partnership and uh, the discussions about uh, business resiliency uh, in the face of cyber, uh, cyber incidents has evolved and transformed the organizations over the year. Um, I think we're at a point where we have a bigger understanding of um, what success lies. And uh, um, where I always like to start with that, um, uh, it has to be a partnership between uh, the cybersecurity and IT teams and the uh, clinical operations, the uh, CO, COO and their teams as well. Um, many times you see some of the pitfalls that you call out here, whereas um, either cybersecurity is taking a step back and not provide, providing that level of uh, leadership and drive in establish this partnership, um, which I, I don't think has been successful in the past. Um, ultimately, most organizations do have 
um, emergency management teams and uh, and uh, and resiliency teams that deal with uh, um, uh, different disasters, and they have been very good at it for decades. The reality is that cyber events um, are increasing in frequency and are much more complicated. So. Uh, in a way, leaving that side of the house alone without support hasn't led to success. And that's why I'm really stressing that what, what became really successful for us was establishing that partnership where um, cybersecurity and business resiliency and our expertise in incident management that has been honed over the years and on the other side, the clinical office of emergency management, business continuity, that should really be placed under the umbrella of the COO and the hospital leaders uh, to drive all of the preparedness is the key to success there. Very interesting. So you like it under the COO. Um, that's very interesting. I think we'll talk more about that. Uh, Adam, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think building on what Julian said, I agree with everything that Julian said there. I think uh, the CISO's role is is really a few different buckets. One is in the training and education and awareness of business leaders to help uh, them understand how um, cyber risk is a risk domain, just like um, physical risk, financial risk, any other risk domain that a business faces. Um, cyber risk is really no different in a lot of ways. Um, there's um, incidents that have a... Um, uh, you know, some some chance of happening on an annual basis, um, depending on the type of incident, um, the outcomes or the, the damage, the impact of that incident can be um, very small, it can be very large somewhere in between. So training, education and awareness around the types of incidents that the business could face, um, applying, you know, hopefully an industry standard risk matrix or risk framework to how you do um, business continuity planning in that respect and business risk planning in that respect. Again, treating cyber as just another risk domain. Um, I also think that uh, the CISO has a responsibility to operate some elements of um, business continuity management and disaster recovery. So specifically around um, coming up with a disaster recovery framework and governing um, disaster recovery as it pertains to IT systems for a cyber attack. Um, specifically at Providence, my team owns um, uh, the disaster recovery side of the house. And what that really means is we work with uh, service owners and application owners to align their apps or their services to business processes and risk rank those according to the business processes that they align to so that we know that if we have a cyber attack or a wildfire or an earthquake, what are the recovery rankings for those applications and those services so we can recover them in a way that makes sense for the business to operate. Um, where our responsibilities end and those of operational leaders begin, I, to me, it really um, there's a pretty clear line as far as uh, operational leaders are responsible for um, owning and operating um, business lines themselves. Um, my delineation on the IT side of the house aligns with, um, you know, very specifically applications, services, IT systems, and the enablement factors for those, those business lines. Um, so in no way, shape, or form should the CISO during a cyber event be going to the business and saying, hey, we need to replace a particular capability because of some event. Uh, it's up to the business if they want to replace a capability. What the CISO should do, though, is educate and inform that business leader to say, hey, we have um, a critical function that we've the business has, has said is a tier one recovery ranking, which means it needs to come up in 30 minutes. Um, but it's a single point of failure. You only have one application that supports that. We should probably onboard a secondary application to support those types of capabilities. So kind of enabling those technical conversations and um, guiding the business leaders to um, um, good decision-making when it comes to resiliency that they bake into their business process. Um, <laughs> biggest threats, underpreparedness? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of businesses also don't really practice their business continuity or disaster recovery processes until a disaster strikes. Um, so yes, the assumption that I thought somebody else was handling that sometimes plays out as a symptom, but I would say, you know, the best time to practice your plans is during peacetime. You don't want to wait till wartime to practice your plans, you know, hold tabletop exercises, test your failover capabilities for your applications when you're not having a ransomware attack against your organization. Um, and then during those incidents, you'll you'll you know hopefully have the tools and the muscle memory to actually recover things in a pretty quick quick order. All right, very good, Paul. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, a lot of great information here. Uh, certainly don't disagree with with any of it and uh, really can kind of underscore you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want. Uh, so preparation is really where uh, the CISO's role is most effective, in, and that is helping operational owners um, and leaders understand what the impacts to their business really are and how are they going to continue to run their business in the absence of digital resources? Uh, because there will be a period of time where those digital resources are just not going to be available, whether it's 30 minutes or four hours or 12 hours or six weeks, they're just not available. So there are important decisions that have to be thought out ahead of time uh, in order to be able to serve our community. So it's very important um, in our role as uh, security advisors, cyber risk advisors, to ensure leaders understand what those risks are and identify the failure points that absolutely prevent them from uh, delivering uh, quality care to our to our community. Um, you know, the, the the worst thing that a hospital can do is go on ambulance divert, right? You know, ambulance divert cancels uh, surgeries. Uh, that hurts the community. That's a direct impact to the community. Uh, so helping helping operational owners understand where they're single legged, where they only have this tiny little system that's supporting a pretty critical part of their uh, their portion of the business. It may not be even even be uh, an enterprise hook. It may be just a portion. And understanding what that criticality of that system really is is particularly important. Yes, there is a role. Uh, for CISOs in helping to craft uh, disaster recovery plans and ranking and stacking uh, those activities. But there is also a role to ensure that crisis management understands uh, where to bring decision points for uh, clinical leadership, executive leadership, so that the crisis is managed as a crisis. It's not just a cyber event. It's actually a crisis. It's a crisis for the entire enterprise. Uh, so, uh, and, and I do agree that cyber is not just the special thing that needs to be handled separately. It is a risk domain and it should be incorporated into the overall risk program for the organization. Excellent. Lots of good stuff in there. Jerry, your thoughts. Um, well, great, uh, great input from the three CISOs on the, on the panel. Uh, I'm not a CISO, so I can, I can talk about it from a, you know, prepared preparedness uh, standpoint. And I agree with a lot of the discussion that already happened. You you want to have a risk profile. You want to understand your applications. Uh, you want to be able to understand the impact of those applications if they're down. Um, but for a cyber attack, I would add into the discussion, um, it's important to really understand or, or have the tooling in place to understand where the root cause uh, began. Because if it, if it truly is a cyber attack and you have uh, an attacker with access into your network and they've compromised some solutions. Um, if you take down an application and just bring it back up again later, there's there's still a chance that that um, person or that team or that uh, organization still has access into your into your network. So how do you deal with that? And unless you have the root cause and you take care of the, the root problem and are able to identify and extract them out of your network, then you're just going to continue to see the, the problem uh, appear in different ways. Um, that was the only thing that I would add into the conversation, but being prepared, be, you know, know how to respond. I like the discussion about practice your response in peacetime. Don't, uh, don't run it for the first time in wartime. Um, great discussion. Great, uh, great input here. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Adam, we're going to start with you here. What's the role of emergency management? Does it function as the quarterback or general manager of both preparedness and incident response? Is it very important for CISOs to educate emergency man management about what different cyber events could look like? For example, explaining how much time users might have between when they are told uh, systems are going to be shut off and when they're actually shut off, how much warning time they would get. I assume it's also critical for emergency management to understand the possible outage durations they could be looking at, because we know these can be much longer than people who are unacquainted with this topic might think. And what are the other dynamics that cybersecurity must communicate to emergency management? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I think if you ask five hospital systems that question, you're going to get five different answers. Um, because every, not every emergency management organization within a hospital system or, uh, you know, whether it's 
one to five hospitals or 50 plus hospitals in our case, not every EM department is going to look the same um, or operate the same. But I'd say generally is uh, that um, organizations, and this this really spans outside of healthcare as well, um, across other sectors outside of, um, you know, yeah, outside of healthcare. What I would say is um, that you should have an organization um, at the corporate level uh, centrally across, whether it's a complex health system or a single hospital or, you know, a small health system, you should have a single centralized entity that quarterbacks employee communication external communication and public relations in the event of, a, of an emergency, um, as well as coordination with um, local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, um, legal, whether it's internal legal or outside counsel, you should have one single centralized entity that's quarterbacking all those different elements of emergency management. I think cyber incidents are a little bit unique when it comes to that. Again, assuming you're handling cyber risk like you're handling other business risks, you're not going to handle a cyber incident response like you handle a wildfire response. But there's going to be a lot of the same underlying mechanics, uh, mechanisms that 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 um, that run during that that event. So again, having that centralized function helps a lot. Um, again, and then going back to cyber event, uh, depending on the type of event that you're facing, you're going to have probably some functional area, uh, functional domain expertise or experts that run um, the incident response process. So in the event of a cyber incident, um, I'm on point. Uh, the CISO is on point for running that um, particular incident response, communicating status updates to the central emergency management or crisis management function, um, helping uh, the board the executive committee um, understand the impacts to the business, um, estimated times of uh, recovery and those, those types of you know, nuts and bolts, I guess, of the incident response, as well as um, the technical aspects that we can communicate out, whether it's with customers to help them protect their networks or law enforcement to help them distribute it or, or go after the bad guys or the ISACs in some case, the health ISAC to help distribute out um, cyber intel out to the broader healthcare community. Um, again, every sector is gonna look a little bit different there. Every hospital system is gonna look a little bit different. Best advice I have is one centralized function and then a functional organization that takes point depending on the type of event you're dealing with. And in the case of cyber, it's me. All right, very good. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, very similar thoughts. Uh, you know, First and foremost, tooling for prevention and, and then detection is, is pretty important. Uh, and ensuring that folks understand that any person in the organization um, is um, uh, is essentially a sensor. So if they see something that makes them concerned, um, uh, they should simply just take action, uh, be accountable for the action, but take action. Um, but right along with this, you know, emergency management is indeed the quarterback for crisis response for the organization and a cyber uh, attack is a crisis for the organization. The cyber ops team is uniquely positioned for the containment and eradication function um, and should be fully engaged in that evidentiary collection, working with our federal partners, uh, uh, communicating with our peer organizations because they're going to want information. Uh, they're going to want tactical information related to the incident itself. But they're also going to want operational information and, and that begins that begins to exceed uh, what cyber operations should really be engaged in. And that's where emergency management comes in. But also, and, and, and we haven't really talked about this here, but there is an element for our um, information technology structure writ large. And, and for us, that's our IT command center. Uh, their job is to maintain operations and restore operations when, when there's a disruption. So they're busy working uh, as well, um, trying to maintain systems even in a degraded state. At the same time, the cyber operations team is is busy doing its work. So there's really a, a triangle of activity that's happening there. Um, so it's important for you know organizations that that have set up similar to this to ensure that um, uh, there's strong communication between uh, the leaders of each of those areas in that the processes that we would engage in a particular incident are uh, communicated effectively so that uh, so that we're working together synergistically rather than um, creating friction points and um, uh, generating misses uh, for the organization. Um, you know, when it comes to um, 
when it comes to the crisis response, really, we need to look at crisis management to enable them to uh, do the communications. Um, I've been brought into many of these conversations as an advisor or an informant. I'm really not the person driving the conversation. And that's, and I believe that's the right way to, um, uh, to uh, help an organization work its way through a crisis. Very good. Jerry, your thoughts? Um, you know, my thoughts are I've been in I've been in the cybersecurity industry for close to 20 years, and there was a time where cyber incidents were not considered similar to other emergencies. Um, so, you know, where we've evolved into is that it's another topic for, you know, an emergency situation is cyber. It needs to be handled in a similar manner to anything else that can happen. Um, so I think that's really important that the discussion so far has has really kind of uh, been talking about emergencies, including cybersecurity and anything else. Um, I think Adam brought up that, you know, the cyber problem is similar in other industries and that is, um, or other verticals, and that is definitely true. I completely agree with it. However, the difference in hospital systems is uh, you can't just shut everything down because you have lives at stake. In other industries, if you if the manufacturing floor has to shut down for a day, you know that's bad for the business, but it you know it ultimately doesn't hurt the the end customer or the patient. So um, having to figure all this out is uh, it, it's a different dynamic in hospital systems, and um, I think we're you know we're all well aware of that. Very good, Julian. Um, I would add a little bit of uh, more nuance, go a little bit more in depth. I mean, I agree with the points uh, that Adam and Paul made, um, particularly how different organizations are structured a little bit different. Um, I think um, one thing that we've uh, uh, done a little bit different um, is that we have both a business continuity and an emergency management functions. They're both under the Office of Emergency Management, if you will. Um, but there's two distinct leaders that collaborate closely. And I think what uh, that enables is first, you have the business continuity effort that's led, engaged under the umbrella of the CO and the hostel leaders put in place all of that training, education, sitting down with all of the um, clinical administrators, uh, doctors, clinicians, and um, be ready, understand what are the critical functions, be ready on how are they going to be able to respond in the absence for an extended period of time of uh, critical IT systems. Um, whereas um, cybersecurity and uh, DR and DR governance in particular on the IT side are focused on how do we enable a level of technology resilience that tries to mirror uh, the recovery um, objectives for those, um, those um, applications uh, that are connected to some of these um, critical business processes. So. Um, Coming back to the main question of is there a single quarterback, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case. The way I view it, it's more of a partnership. Um, I absolutely agree that when a, a, when a, a critical outage happens, be it a disaster from a, from a weather event or cybersecurity, you need to have the emergency management team and the business continuity come together, quickly assess what is the business impact, let's activate the business continuity plan. All of that has nothing to do with technology. Uh, in, in parallel, the technology uh, assembles and has an incident team trying to look at, okay, where are we are, how long it'll take um, uh, for recovery. Now, the key point is that you cannot um, be successful with um, having those two things in uh, in silos. So where this, uh, the answer to, to your question about quarterbacking, I think is joint, right? We meet closely together at all major phases in an incident. So when, uh, when the initial declaration happened, you have business continuity, emergency, IT, DR, 
everybody's sharing that initial information. And then we have touch points with those leaders participating both on the IT side, on the business continuity side. And the reason why that is critical is that uh, in that flow of information to happen is one, uh, for the business continuity and uh, emergency management to be able to make decisions, they need to have up-to-date information of, uh, of uh, the IT recoverability. Um, I mean, we've all had some, some recent outages that were extended and that information, when it goes after a number of hours, drives the decision, okay, do I have to reschedule surgeries? You don't want to have patients in the morning driving for multiple hours going to the OR prep and not be able to be taken care of, right? Um, obviously, there is a lot of uh, other impacts that go with that. But then if you have enough information to say, oh, this looks like it's going to be a couple of hours, that's, that, that, that's critical for decision making. And vice versa. Uh, the uh, the clinical teams could say, listen, are you going to uh, uh, to give us the alternative of this system, the other system, because we can continue and do most of the critical th um, things that we need with just those two or three alternatives. So that's where that that kind of synergy and partnership that I keep referring to uh, pays dividends, in my opinion. All right, very good, Julian. Thank you. Uh, next question. We're going to start with you, Paul. Collaboration is a key to preparedness, as we've discussed. What can get in the way of collaboration? And as you engage with op operational leaders, what do you find is the most challenging aspect to gain commitment on action? Well, this is really a people game. Uh, so certainly connecting with folks, understanding their perspective. Uh, this gets back to some of the basic communication tenants like active listening and so forth. Um, and establishing that good relationship with folks. What can get in the way are um, a different view on priorities, uh, 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 different distractors that other people or yourself may be dealing with. And it's important to, to, to call those out early and to try to set those aside so that you can focus on, on the matter at hand. So Collaboration is is key to success. It, it, no single area, no single department, we already know this, is, is going to be successful in managing through a crisis without uh, some level of collaboration. That collaboration, however, it needs to begin long before the crisis. It needs to be a part of the business. It needs to be the fabric of how you work. Uh, and as long as it's the fabric of how you work, the relationships will be there. Uh, understanding will be there. Uh, not everybody has a good day. Right. So knowing that and being able to adjust for that happens over time. You learn people over time. You're not going to learn them through one or two meetings. So uh, so those are some of the things I think about when it comes to uh, reducing obstacles to collaboration uh, and trying to be present for my peers and, and uh, hoping and encouraging them to be present present for me as well. Well, I think that's brilliant. I mean, <laughs> just the idea of not everybody's having a good day is is just it's so important right because you could have these critical individuals that you need engagement with you have to deal with you need them to work with you and sometimes they're just having a bad day and it's like okay i'll i'll check back in with you next week right so this is the emotional intelligence that we have to have at this high level and sometimes being successful with these things depends more on that than any kind of advanced technologies, right? It's like, okay, I'm gonna leave them alone because they're having a bad day. Really, really brilliant point. Jerry, your thoughts? Um, well, first of all, I, I agree. The emotional awareness is, is very key. Um, but the other thing that, and Paul mentioned the word priorities, you know, I think priorities come into play. And if you really just kind of look at the IT perspective and you talk about cybersecurity, you know, you've got an IT team whose main responsibility is to you know, keep all the systems up and running, keep them updated with the latest versions, the latest patches. You've got a network team that really wants to keep the network up and running. You've got a cybersecurity team that's trying to understand uh, alerts and events that have occurred. And uh, whenever you get into any kind of incident, they're not necessarily aligned. Um, that you've got people driving into different directions. And I, and I think a leadership role is to 
really understand the priority and get everyone aligned on the right uh, the right set of priorities. Because I, I I've seen it happen even to the point where, you know, an IT team, a networking team, a security team, they even have different tools and they're seeing different data, and the information that they're working from is different. Um, and so getting that to collaborate across the different data that they have and setting the right priorities, I think is um, is key to handling these situations that we've been talking about. Very good, Julian. Yeah, thanks, uh, Anthony. I would say that um, for me, it's critical to obtain the support and sponsorship at the very top of the uh, clinical executive leadership. Um, in the past, so many business continuity efforts failed in, in across industries because um, it was thought of, about as an IT only effort. Um, and uh, despite all the effort that IT teams have done, they haven't concentrated on gaining um, that buy-in from the very top on the business. Once you're able to achieve that, and depending on the organization, depending on the industry, is an effort. And that's where uh, the cybersecurity leaders' leadership comes, uh, comes together connecting those dots, things, uh, uh, things go uh, at a different speed. And uh, with that level of support from clinical leadership, then you're able to engage uh, the ambulatory, the inpatient, the clinicians. Um, and once you have that engagement, they quickly realize how beneficial this is. And this snowballs into a very successful initiative. But getting that an initial um, uh, point where they're at the table and listening, um, it's where where it's paramount to have that sponsorship. Great point. Excellent. Adam, your thoughts? Yeah, I think Jerry said it really well. Um, it really comes down to prioritization. Uh, you know, I've yet to meet a uh, clinical leader or an operational leader that's not interested in doing the right thing as it pertains to cyber resiliency, uh, but they're trying to balance that with patient care they're trying to balance that with, you know, limited hours in the day, frankly, um, and other initiatives to return our health system to financial well-being. So I think as as we think about collaboration and preparedness for disasters um, like cyber incidents, uh, cyber disasters, um, it's how do you get these things prioritized in a way that's not disrupting patient care and disrupting, I'd say, foundational elements like financial health and well-being of the system. You know, if we're not bringing in enough money to um, to pay our clinicians and upgrade our equipment and um, continue operating as a business, then we're not going to we're not going to operate, and so there won't be anything to attack from a cyber cyber perspective. So you know, does it make sense for us to prioritize um, cyber incident uh, preparedness over um, financial health and well being? Well, maybe in some cases, um, but in other cases, you're going to have to. It's a balancing act. So. Uh, again, I think it's just a question of prioritization. Um, it's a question of, you know, getting that commitment. I think Julian said that um, and engaging at the right level. Excellent. All right. Very good. Uh, we're sort of going to go uh, a little bit with the front end of, of this type of a process now and talk about detection and these type of things. So the sooner one knows of a breach, the sooner it can be addressed. What are your thoughts around achieving rapid detection? Uh, Jerry, going to go with you first. Um, you know, rapid detection requires tooling. It requires um, putting instrumentation down in, in the right place um, so that you have visibility into what's occurring and, and you can detect the anomalies, you can detect the, the potential attack vector. Um, what we see is a lot of people focused on who can access the network and you're looking at, you know, what we call north-south traffic data that's coming from outside the network coming in. Um, and really trying to look for anomalies there. And, and that can be a great way to do it. Um, but we also need to be looking inside the network so that we can detect that someone has compromised the system and they're moving forward. So um, when you're looking at the north-south thing, there's tons of tools out there that can give you the rapid detection. The problem is there's probably too many um, because attackers are constantly pinging your network. They're constantly sending phishing. Uh, they're constantly sending malware around it's the volume of data is really hard to keep up with. So, you know, that that's a that's kind of a given in the world that we live in today. Uh, and we're detecting all of these things, but there's we're detecting so much stuff, it's hard to get through and really feel, find out what actually worked from the attacker 
point of view. So if you can look inside the network and really discover compromised systems that are doing things that they shouldn't, that, that really helps you to really uncover an incident rather than just spending your time looking after, through tons of alerts from lots of different tools. Jerry, just a quick follow-up. Um, is this one of those areas where AI is being used both by um, the tool providers like yourself probably and the bad guys? So it's like that arms race of who's going to use it better? Yeah, the bad guys are using AI to be... Um, you know, to find out who they want to attack, you know, who are the, who are the susceptible people, who has the keys to the kingdom, basically, um, and as well as crafting phishing emails or whatever it is they're doing, crafting that much better than what they used to, uh, making it more realistic, um, really, tr you know, advancing their way in. On the defender side, uh, there's a lot of work being put into um, collecting data from a lot of different tools and then bringing that into kind of an automated um, first level of triage of all of these mm -hmm. different alerts to try to figure out, you know, there's all these, let's, I, I'll keep using phishing as an example. Um, you've got all these phishing emails and we're generating all these alerts, but the ones that really matter is when somebody actually clicks it, they enter some information, next steps start to happen. So finding that is more important than digging through all the, the threats that are occurring, knowing that they're there and training your people that they're there is really important. But what actually accomplished that first step. There's AI being put into um, those discovery steps as well. So good question, Anthony. Thank you, Julian. I, I think like my, uh, yeah, my, uh, my predecessors uh, uh, here, um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's really paramount to do an early detection. Um, and where we need to focus more is those fringe areas of our technology and the environment, particularly as the complexity of attacks um, uh, continues to increase. Many are just continue to uh, be, um, um, uh, or think there is sufficient to look at uh, traditional computers, whereas many of the threats uh, or attacks come through either um, third parties, um, hospital providers, and those were areas that have traditionally been more neglected, both from a tool provider perspective, as well as cybersecurity professionals. So I guess my one message here would be to make sure that we have a comprehensive approach to detecting suspicious behavior in all aspects of technology. Now, the other uh, point I would make is that equally important is to take advantage of the people's factor. Um, I can say that in numerous occasions, our first alert, not always certainly, but in many cases, the first alert came from somebody who noticed something suspicious, be it a help desk, be it um, a regular employee. And that's where the culture, the education, the ability for them to be able to reach someone quickly can make a difference before between no impact and some significant impact. So Julian, it's people are really involved too, not just technologies, the people are going to help. I, I think so. I think they can be a tremendous help. There's um, in many cases, they are the very first to uh, find that something is suspicious, that someone should look into it. Very good, Adam. Yeah, uh, a few things come to mind here. So um, one is uh, getting control of your identities in your ecosystem. And I'd say just taking a step back, focusing on the fundamentals, um, always pays off in spades. Um, so again, identities, get, getting control of your identities, instituting things like conditional access in your ecosystem, multi-factor authentication. You have to do multi-factor authentication on everything, not just your inter internet facing assets, everything, every authentication needs to be MFA or at least the initial MFA uh, needs to take place to protect that transaction. Uh, because, and the reason I say that is because if an attacker is able to take over an identity of one of your users and use it as the user, you know, act as the user, then it looks like legitimate activity in your environment. You could have bad actors in your Office 365 and not even know it because they're using your users' legitimate identities. Um, so if you can't detect it because it looks legitimate, you're never going to find it um, and you're never going to achieve rapid detection, that's for sure. Uh, the other piece is when you look at your business assets, so your laptops, your desktops, your cloud assets, um, cloud runtimes, et cetera, uh, protecting those with um, 
I'd say, you know, quote unquote, traditional um, endpoint detection and response technology. Um, we use a leading EDR technology here at, at, at Providence um, to protect our assets. Um, and I'd say install that on every single one of your assets that connects to your ecosystem. Um, if it's supported, it's installed EDR, that EDR is connected back into your SEM, or hopefully um, another piece that I mentioned here around EDR is a lot of the EDR providers are um, now rolling out um, integrated SEMs as a feature of their capabilities um, that ingest the right telemetry at the right time and give your teams, they enable your teams with the right knowledge and right control of those assets to be able to take action very rapidly and sometimes in an automated fashion, most times in an automated fashion. So again, adopt EDR technology, deploy it on everything, have positive control, positive visibility of all assets in your environment. Um, and also, again, the patching rigor, the fundamentals, the patching rigor, the vulnerability management, making sure that you're managing vulnerabilities in your environment and not giving attackers open doors and open windows to exploit and get into your ecosystem. And if you do those basic things, you're going to eliminate probably 99% of the issues that you have to deal with. On the AI point, uh, Anthony, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I have yet to see an AI technology that's useful to detect or defeat uh, an ongoing attack. Um, in fact, I think a lot of these technologies are really being overhyped, specifically in the Microsoft Copilot side of the house. I have yet to see a Microsoft Copilot that um, doesn't create more work than it eliminates, um, especially on the security side of the house. But look, I think we're in the early days of AI adoption and AI technology use and security specifically. So maybe you know, maybe a year from now, a couple of years from now, it'll be a different story. But right now, I think AI, you know, is really just being used by attackers for better social engineering. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple of use cases around vulnerability discovery and exploit creation that are on the horizon, but we're not there yet. So, Adam, it's 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 really you creating those beautiful, probably phishing emails. Um, that's but that that's a difference maker, right? Because they they yeah. dump in, they can probably dump in all kinds of facts about the person they're targeting, all kinds of stuff from their social feed, dump yeah. that in and write the most gorgeous phishing email. Couldn't do that before, but now they can. Yeah, it would take them a little bit of effort to do that. And the command of the English language, both depending on your 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 victim, it would take a command of their native language, which is, is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And so the types of things that we tell users to look out for in phishing emails, like misspellings and that sort of thing, don't really work. And like you said, it can be it can create a very targeted hook. So, um, yeah, the social engineering angle is is concerning when it comes to large language model technology in particular. But again, if you have EDR technology installed on your assets, you're controlling um, identities and you have multi-factor and other conditional access uh, controls applied, then phishing becomes less of a risk all up. So um, the answer is yes, but um, I think investing in the basics still is the best thing to do. Very good, Paul. Yeah, you know, a lot of great information here. So there is no substitute for doing the basics. Uh, just simply do it. Uh, before you start doing anything else fancy or trying to spin a new capability, the basics are important. Uh, so if if an organization is struggling with patch management and, and, and rebooting those servers, that's got to get fixed first. Um, you know, and, and as far as, EDR is concerned, I'm a strong advocate for install it everywhere. That includes unmanaged assets and vendor managed assets. Um, it's it's a line of defense. It's an important line of defense. Uh, but, you know, I want to kind of spin this back just a little bit. It's important to understand yourself first. Uh, and then uh, equally important to understand the adversaries that you're facing. You, you really have to have that uh, not that knowledge to to really mount a, a good defense. Um, and then you need to identify and watch for where the adversary can take advantage of you. Uh, these are the inter that's the intersection between those two bodies of information. And that will help inform you as to whether or not you've got the right controls in place, you've got the right preventions in place. Uh, and and if you don't, what's the next best thing best thing? What what are you going to do in, in those spaces? Um, you know, to do that, you're going to need on on staff. Uh, you're going to need the intelligence, of course, but you're going to need an uh, intel analyst on staff that's that's familiar with fusing that kind of information. So, for those that have gone beyond the basics, that have essentially got the basics in place, start thinking about how you use information to form uh, intelligence, and then use that intelligence to drive how you how you mount your defense. And it's not 
the security team that's mounting the defense. It's the operators of the services that are being delivered that are mounting that defense. So there's a synergy between cybersecurity operations and information assurance, which is the compliance piece and, and operators of the digital environment. You know, that, that ecosystem uh, needs to be well-informed uh, so that uh, operators, uh, owners of services can uh, adjust their their posture to provide a better defense. And at the end of the day, yes, we want to stop the adversary. We want to stop them cold. But if we can't stop them, we need at least need to slow them down enough to allow for uh, an organizational reaction uh, to uh, secure our environment. And that's really the name of the game. Uh, we're not going to stop all the cyber attacks. They will gain some advantage and some entry point to some degree. Uh, it's important to to know that and understand that and make sure that uh, uh, the leaders in your organization that are supporting you know that, um, that it's, this is really about having a defense in depth overlap and coverage where necessary and slowing the adversary down just enough to give uh, give you essentially the tactical advantage to thwart their their um, attack on you. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. All right. Now for my favorite part, uh, ask a co-panelist. And we're going to start with you, Jerry. Do you have a question for one or more of your co-panelists? Um, so, you know, I was really interested in what Paul was just saying um, and, you know, slowing the attacker down. Um, so the way that you kind of look at, or I look at it as across, uh, I think Miter's done a great job with the attack framework and they lay out the tactics and techniques that an attacker has to do. And they have to go through between eight to 10 to 12 different steps. And rapid detection doesn't really mean that you catch them on the first one. It means that you could catch them before the last one where they steal data or they run ransomware and they compromise your system, whatever it is. Um, so the question would be, um, you know, how do you, kind of detect um, not that you know the earliest stage but that a, a host has been compromised and and what would you do about it following that was that for Paul yeah sorry okay yeah. very good Paul um so but yes this is where defense in depth is is important so knowing that uh, threat actors uh, pride themselves I guess in uh finding ways around your defenses in order to culminate on, on objectives inside your environment. Uh, it's important to ensure that you've got detection capability right along that uh, that attack path, the kill chain, the, the, the MITRE sequence, or whatever, whatever framework you happen to be using, but ensure that you've got uh, the ability to understand that, oh, this is not quite right. And a lot of times it's not a single piece of information. It's, it's, it's typically, um, an, an amalgamation of, of several pieces of information that, that begin to paint that picture. So the first time that an anomalous login happens on a server, okay, that might be a new person that you're unaware of that's actually supposed to be there. But as soon as you start having strange processes spin up or lateral movement from that server, now you've got something. And, that, and that's that's where your detection begins to, uh, begins to paint that picture and allow you to do something about that. Um, so I, I guess um, under, it, it's important for your operators to understand that um, uh, they they need to be able to uh, have the tooling and processes in place that will allow uh, allow that picture to emerge. Adam or Julian, anything you want to add on that? No. Okay. Very good. Uh, well, let's go to Julian. Do you have a question for one or, or more of your co-panelists? Yeah, I, I want to ask my fellow CISOs because I think it's probably something that's top of mind for the cybersecurity leaders on our call today. Um, how or what are you? some of your tactical advice on building that relationship, that partnership with the um, uh, business leaders that uh, you need in place to be to be successful uh, for for a, re, for a successful resiliency plan preparation and execution during an incident. Adam, we'll start. Yeah, with I you. can jump in. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually. And I think there's a variety of different me methods you can use, but the best method that I've seen kind of applies to how you build those types of relationships with other arenas as well or other topics as well, and that that really specifically is give them some level of ownership over the process. Uh, people like to have skin in the game, 
Um, so for example, um, when we uh, govern things like disaster recovery at Providence, we have a cyber risk council that involves elements of our chief operating officers organization, our physician enterprise, um, our nursing organization, um, our IT, broader IT organization, our risk, legal, HR, finance, you name it, they're all represented on that cyber risk council. And so by giving them some sense of ownership over the process, they have skin in the game, they have input into the um, solutions that are going to be um, proposed and implemented throughout the business. Um, and that also has the um, added benefit of making those solutions that you implement practical to the business, easy to implement, easy to easy to get them to accept, but also helps with prioritization um, to the points that we were talking about on one of the earlier questions. All right, very good. Um, Adam, uh, do you have a question for one or more of your co-panelists? Yeah, I guess I'll I'll flip it back since it sounds like a few of you guys have already responded or you know had questions asked to you, Julian. Um, do you do cyber exercises in your health system, and how do you think of cyber exercises um, at operator level, executive level, at the board level? Yeah, I think we have uh, we have different types of exercises. To your point, Adam, just to make sure we. Um, uh, we pro are properly focused at the right level, at the right tier. So we have exercises with the executive leadership team. We have um, exercises that we do from an IT perspective. Um, and we have um, exercises where um, there is a business continuity only aspect to it, uh, led by emergency management. And there's some where there's a mesh of the two. Um, actually, we've done some uh, even regional with some of our healthcare uh, through uh, uh, through CIS, I think they're they're a great resource where we got together um, not just um, cybersecurity but leaders across um, compliance uh, um, operations communication etc across multiple health systems, and we had a pretty successful simulation but also learning from each other as well as um, exposure of how different functions come together and execute really well so in short i think we we need that multifaceted multi-tiered approach um, that's tailored to different audiences to be the most successful at it all right very good anyone else want to jump in on that all right paul you're up you have a question for one or more of your co-panelists all right, I guess um, it'll be for both of my fellow CISOs, and we'll start with uh, you, Julian. As you engage with operational leaders, and this might be a bit of a repeat, but I'm kind of looking for your um, tactical um, tactical approach. Uh, but as you engage with operational leaders, uh, what do you find is the most challenging aspect to gain commitment on action? assuming that the conversation you're having with them is to get them to act. What is that? What, what is the most challenging aspect uh, that, that you've encountered and, and how have you tried to uh, resolve that? Yeah, I think in our case, we haven't run into as much of the, uh, the challenge with commitment. And part of that is the fact that we gain the support and uh, um, and the visibility of the importance of business continuity, particularly uh, for the clinical areas from the board, from the level of CEO, and then it, it trickled down. I think in our case is what make, made us, I think the implementation part, which I think uh, you're alluding to more successful is that um, outside of having a dedicated business continuity team and function, um, they have went about it in, uh, kind of departmental and clinical area focus. So rather than try to um, be very broad, they went department by department, entity by entity. So that's that that's was one part of the recipe for uh, for success. Um, I think the other piece that I think we found the most challenging is um, getting uh, clinicians and administrators to really understand, what is it that's going to be most critical um, to them? And I think that's where as that, that's the key. As much as possible, if you can make that real and say, here's the list of things that are not available to you this second, what will you do? 
Um, I think that gets to the best uh, kind of planning and the less likelihood that there's going to be surprises when an actual outage happens. I hope that answer the question. Thank you. Thank Adam, you. Do anything you for want? Adam? Yeah, tactically, it's, uh, in my experience, the most difficult thing is getting funding to support some of the initiatives. So mm -hmm. building in some of the resiliency in an application that supports business process or take the case of change healthcare. Look, uh, change healthcare has a few competitors in the, in, in their domain and insurance clearing and, and whatnot, um, and pharmacy clearing. Um, but onboarding those competitors and, uh, it comes at a cost, uh, whether it's a time cost for, um, the operators or the clinicians out in the field or uh, to get it onboarded and trained on a new platform um, or just a pure resource cost. And so I think tactically, um, you know, you can get things prioritized as part of a project, but where the rubber meets the road is, is it funded? Um, is it going to require people in your facilities to go re-IP systems? And who's going to pay for those human resources to go out there and actually do the work? Uh, that's where I've seen the biggest challenge. All right, listen, we are almost out of time. I'm going to I'm going to go through the the panel here and get a final piece of parting advice and uh Jerry, we're going to start with you. Um, you know, as a cybersecurity product developer, one of the things that we really look at, you talked about um endpoint EDR, yeah, it's necessary. Um, but whether it's EDR or NDR, you know, there's detection and response. Um People talk about mean time to detection and mean time to response, but in between those two, there's knowledge. And knowledge is, I think Paul um, talked about it a little bit, based on data that you acquire from many different sources. Uh, and you know, at NetScout, we think network is the, the biggest or one of the areas that you really need to have visibility into across the whole network um, and all of your different applications as they speak to each other. And as people talk to it, a lot of times the response can be automated. If it's a laptop, you can take that off. Um, but if the problem is with a, a, a critical server that's in your environment, you know, you're not going to just shut that down, um, without some knowledge of why you're doing it and how it's there. So that knowledge piece and mean time to knowledge is, is a really important piece that happens between the D and the R, um, and, you know, people like to talk about detections, but once you detect something, you really need to understand what you've detected. Uh, and that's the meantime to, to knowledge. Um, and that's the investigation piece that happens between the D and the R. And, uh, and we think that's really important in any cybersecurity discussion. Excellent, Jerry. Thank you. Julian? If there is one thing that I would wrap, with, uh, wrap up with, I would say that... Uh... Um, ultimately, um, it is back to the cybersecurity leader to have uh, to have the approach of a senior leader uh, step up and establish those partnerships, um, influence all the other partners in this entire ecosystem to make uh, make it successful. Um, you just cannot uh, do it by uh, playing defense, taking a step back, and hoping things will. Uh, um, uh, work or they will work in a way that is not uh, the responsibility or core responsibility of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity IT. Excellent, Julian. Paul? You know, at, at, at the end of the day, this is really a people game. Uh, leaders, peers, partners, customers, adversaries, operators, and defenders uh, work the relationships. Um, be transparent, be vulnerable. Uh, that's really kind of the watchword I would I would put out there, especially for fellow CISOs that that are looking for advice in this in this space. Uh, there are a lot of CISOs out there who are willing to give advice, uh, not not withstanding this group here, but there are, are plenty of us out there that are willing to have the conversation, uh, share our experiences, share with what works, share what doesn't work. Uh, so certainly work those relationships and um, again be transparent and and be vulnerable. Excellent. Adam, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think, um, you know, great points uh, that were brought up. Um, I, my best advice I have is this is a huge area, business resiliency, disaster recovery, disaster response. Um, lots and lots of different facets to this problem. Um, the bad news is, is it's a big problem to solve. The good news is, is because it has many facets and many different parts that compose an effective 
disaster recovery, business continuity, you know, playbook, if you will, you don't have to solve all these problems all at once. So try to carve that problem up into bite-sized chunks and solve them one at a time and involve the business in that process. Wow, excellent, excellent conversation. Lots of great information in there. Regarding uh, continuing education, you could use the final slide. In this deck, you'll get an email when the on-demand recording is ready for viewing. If you wanna sponsor an event with us, you could reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I wanna thank our tremendous panel, Julian Mihai, Adam Zoller, Paul Carrillo, and Jerry Mancini. I wanna thank NetScout for making this discussion possible and you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.